All right, well, ladies, welcome to a session that I have untitled Unstoppable. Last night, what was last night's word? Unshakable, tonight is unstoppable. But here's the thing, I don't know about you, as I was looking at the themes, um, I need to preach in tennis more often, Pastor Becca, because I get to bounce and it's just like fun. Those high heels, they're trash. Um, <laughs> but as a Latina, if you're like, my grandmother would be like, why are you so short? Put on some high heels. So I think when we, need, when we look at the word, when we look at the word unstoppable, I think sometimes if you're anything like me, the concept of unstoppable might make you feel as in it's that person. Whoa, they are unstoppable. As if there's like a superhuman element to what they're doing. But do you know what the word unstoppable means? That you don't stop. <laughs> it was my junior year of high school and I was captain of the track team. And it was our very first invitational for the season. This is where all the schools in the district come together and you get to size each other up. That's basically what it is. And it was in the cool of this Saturday morning. And because it was seven schools in our district, there was a lot of people in the stands. So there was fans on one side of the track and fans on the other side of the track. And as a junior representing a captain, which is very rare, usually with seniors, I wanted to show the team and demonstrate to the team, like, we got this, we're gonna roll up. This is amazing. Well, I had been training to run the 330 hurdles. What would possess a 5'2 Mexican to jump over things? I don't know. But let's just say I've always been a woman of faith because I was like, I can do all things in Christ. All right. So we're in the starting blocks and we are hunkered down. My fingers are taut together as we are on the gravel of the track, my feet are in the starting blocks. To the left of me was Franisha, to the right of me was Aisha, sisters and sisters, if you know what I mean, who stood at about seven foot nine, probably. <laughs> the gun goes off, pop, and we are going on the track. I clear the first hurdle like I am a professional athlete. I have a rhythm step, one, two, three, four, five, six, jump, one, two, three, four, five, six, jump. I clear the second hurdle, the third hurdle, the fourth hurdle, but as approaching the fifth hurdle, I did the thing that my coach told me never to do. Never look to your right, never look to your left. It will throw off your pattern, it will throw off your rhythm. Well, I did that and my knee caught the fifth hurdle. I did not fall, but I did stumble, throwing off my cadence. So when I came to the sixth hurdle, my knee fully caught it as well as my shin, and I fall to the floor. Not to be outdone, I stand back up, and I run over and try to jump over the second hurdle. The same thing happens on the floor. Get back up. Same thing happens after the eighth. Same thing happens after the ninth. By the tenth hurdle, I'm crying. My knees are bloody. My shins are bruised, and I just pick my legs up over the the hurdle and limp to the finish line. I fall to the floor and I am mortified because they brought in an ambulance, friends. <laughs> an ambulance put me on a stretcher, took me to the first aid station and my coach comes up to me. I see her, Coach Julia, I see her in my mind's eye even to this day and she says, I'm so proud of you. Proud of me? Did you see what happened? The race and the heat behind me passed me on the track. Okay, like, no. She said, you didn't give up, you didn't stop, and you ran your race. Being unstoppable doesn't mean that you have a superpower. Being unstoppable means that you just don't stop. So it shouldn't be a surprise to you today that the person that we're gonna be taking a look at is again, my Bible boyfriend, again in the book of Acts. So do me a favor, pull out your Bibles and we are gonna look at a man who is unstoppable. My prayer today is that we are fully inspired, that no matter what hurdle we hit, no matter how we fall and in who we fall in front of, Proverbs tells us that the righteous fall and they get back up. Look at Acts 27, starting in verse 20. When neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have, been, then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. Look at verse 22. Now I urge you, I beg of you, I plead with you, to keep up your courage. If you brought your own Bible, circle that and highlight that. 
If you didn't, turn to your neighbor and circle and highlight it for them. <laughs> because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. See, this is what happened, y'all. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must, underline in your Bible, you must circle in your Bible. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Somebody say it will happen. I love that because I'll be honest with you, last night you were amazing, but I felt like it was a little bit of a monologue. Today we're gonna have a dialogue, okay? So when the Spirit of God hits you, you could say amen, hallelujah. Come on somebody, I'm here for it. That word was for me. If you brought your cardinal friend, you nudge him and say that word was for you, okay? That's how we're gonna play today. In verse 20, Paul sets the scene. There's over 200 prisoners and Paul that were about to give up. Have you ever felt like you have been in a raging storm with no end in sight? We can talk about unstoppable. We can talk about unashamed. We can talk about unshaken. But what happens when the boat doesn't stop rocking, the night feels really, really dark and you don't think you're gonna, have a, you're gonna, think you're gonna make it. Well, see, Paul, Paul has a divine encounter that was dropped in his life and it determined his destiny. That's what I'm praying to happen at Sparkle, that y'all have a divine encounter with a conversation with somebody, a word that's spoken from platform in a moment of worship, in a moment of prayer with our lovely servants wearing the pink lanyards and prayer team. I, I mean, I believe that you can have a divine encounter. And I wanna be today in the middle of your storm, a Pauline voice that says the storm is here, but we gonna make it. We're gonna make it. Look at verse 24. And an angel said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. It will happen. Uh, I've said this before and it's not lost on me. Uh, Paul is a man of God. Paul is an amazing man of God who is passionate about uh, the things of God, a learned man. He had stuttered, uh, studied under a phenomenal teacher. He's a learned man, multiple languages. But you know what I like about my boy Paul? I call him Petty Paul. Cause we all, I don't care how holy you are, we all have a little bit of petty in us. Did y'all catch what Paul said? Uh, in verse 21, he said, if you would have listened to me, we could have avoided this. We all have those moments, don't lie. Now, maybe you are Minnesota nice and you keep it inside. Pray for me, saints, because I'm not there yet, okay? It's called sanctification. You can ask anyone on my team, you can ask my family, you can ask my friends. I have this phrase, I say it's so sweet, like I'm from Dallas and everything's lovely. And I say, it is. You know what it is? is? I-T-Y-S, I told you so, all right? <laughs> So Paul's looking at the soldiers and Paul's looking at the crewmen and Paul's looking at the men in the boat and he's like, it is. <laughs> See, Paul told the soldiers not to sail to Crete, but now here they are. Have you ever been there? Have you ever found yourself in a place paying the price for somebody else's decisions? And if I'm honest with you, can I say this? Paying the price for somebody else's stupidity? For the woman in here who you just found out very recently that your husband had an affair or was in, there was a moment of infidelity, I'm just gonna let you know that that's not your fault. Have you ever found yourself in a place where you're paying the consequences for something that you did not do? Even as a Christian, we go through these moments where we sometimes feel, or it is the case, that we're handling the repercussions of someone else's mistakes. You don't know the reason, but you have to deal with the fallout of that. That's hard for me because see, I'm the why person. I've been like this since I was a kid. Ask my mother, Bianca, do your chores. Why? Bianca, do your homework. Why? Bianca, take a shower. Why? It's like I needed, I needed a legal court case to prove to me why you asked me to do anything. I need answers. And as an adult, I'm still asking those why questions. I'm a great woman of faith but I got me some why questions. Why did the pandemic happen? Why did, my, why did my friend's husband cheat on her and leave her? 
Why is church planting so hard? We're telling people about Jesus. It should be easy. Why, why, why are finances as crazy as they are? See, in Paul's situation, I want you to hear, hold the tension, hold the tension. I want you to hear his convictions, but I also want you to hear his confusion. See, his conviction was, if you would have listened to me, this wouldn't have happened. But there's also a conviction. He says, but because my God, we will get to our destination. But you want to know what isn't answered here? The why. Why did this happen? And this is difficult for me because I want to be a person who knows the answers. And maybe I have some relatives in here where you feel the same way. And my fear is, and I, oh my gosh, Pastor Jeremy's word, he's not here because I would personally thank him. I stopped taking notes and I texted him, um, send me your notes, bro. It was so good. It was so good. But see, he alluded to something that I want to make sure that like, it sticks with us. In moments of pain, trauma, and loss as Christians, if you have a faith background, we are prone to go to our Instagram meme theology where we slap a verse up on it and say, bless God. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. No, 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 no. But in those moments, we don't need regurgitated theology we don't need Pinterest faith. We don't need memes. What we need is a reminder. God is good. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't like it. But God is good. Sometimes we just find ourselves saying, God, give me a reason. Better than a reason, give me reassurance that this problem will end with a plan and this pain will have purpose. Anybody feel me on that one? And the reason why sometimes we are afraid to open up that can is because we're gonna feel let down by God. That if we ask him to situ change a situation and it doesn't happen, we feel like God let us down or God does not have power. No, God has a plan. And there's people that will try to ascribe your issue. Oh, well, the reason that happened is because, er, stop, start. No, 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 you ain't God. You can't tell me why this is happening. Only God knows. And in a world that is eagerly looking for answers. I humbly submit to you today that I do not know, based on biblical history or personal history, what the Lord is doing. We may not know the why, but sisters, we got to know the who. Now that might feel like the cop-out answer to you. Like, oh, Jesus fixed it. No, 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 I'm really saying, no, no, no. If we stay, this is why I'm pushing this really hard. We're gonna jump into the rest of the text, but I feel like this has the foundation. If we keep on asking the why, we'll end up in bitterness. But if we trust the who, it's an act of surrender. I don't know, I don't get it, but I am trusting God. Look at verse 23. Last night, angel of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. Sometimes our surrender, even in the midst of the storm, we are positioned to hear and encounter God. If you don't believe me, Last night was a moment for many women who stood up regarding a specific situation, whether it was a healing or a believing or standing in proxy of, that even in the middle of the storm, we could have a divine encounter. And, 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 and an angel comes to Paul and so convinces Paul that Paul says, yo, it has to happen. Somebody say it has to happen. You might not know the why, but sister, you got to know the who. I don't know why but I believe that God does good and I believe that God is good. I'm confused on the why, but my conviction, my conviction is with the Lord. I don't know why this is happening, but God sent me an angel, look at verse 26. Nevertheless, so he had a conviction, but he said, but in this translation, nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Uh, Please hear me say this. I think sometimes we're prone to think like, if we're having this conversation, like it should be easy. Like we're in the middle of a storm, but don't be scared. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to be scared, but we don't waver. We don't take our foot off the gas. We keep on moving forward. We cannot put our faith in fear. We put our faith in a good father who cares for us and loves for us. And Paul tells them, hey, we're gonna make it, but it's not gonna be on this boat. And that was what God spoke to me. Bianca, you're gonna make it through this season, but it's not gonna look how it was. You're gonna, not, you're gonna make it. The church is gonna make it, but it's not gonna be in this building. Bianca, you're gonna make it. That's the word I wanna bring to you today. I've lived through it. Let me save you the learning curve. Child of God, you're gonna make it, but it's gonna look different. Now, guess what? As Paul said it would happen, guess what? 
it did. Look at uh, chapter 28, drop down a few verses to chapter 28, verse one. Once safely, so they ran up on shore. The boat was busted. Everyone like doggy paddled in salty sea water to the shore. And here we go in verse one. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. Malta, I love the nuances of the Bible. I'm doing good on time. We're gonna take a little, a little word nerd break. The word Malta for the note takers in the house, it means refuge. Ooh, little detail there. Ooh, yes. The Bible is so juicy. Sometimes I just wanna like lick the pages of it. Oh, that is good. Of all the islands in this region, they ended up on refuge. That's my God right there. God gave Paul a word in the storm and the details of the Bible put Paul and his friends and the 280 something inmates on an island called Refuge. He took them from the raging sea and put them on sure foundation. They were unshaken at this point. Hello, throwback to yesterday's message. Look at verse two. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Uh, the word islanders in your translation is very kind and very generous because in the original language, word nerd detail for you, in the original language, that word isn't islanders, that word is barbarians. And you know where we get the word barbarians from? Because the Greeks felt like anyone who didn't speak Greek, their language sounded like bar, 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 bar. And that's how they got the name barbarians. So they're in foreign soil with people who do they not, they do not look like and language they do not understand. So let's get this picture in our mind. Paul was wrongly imprisoned. He was put on a boat. He was given a word, don't go to Crete. And they went to Crete. They went through a storm and they doggy paddled to a shore. It is raining and cold. And now they're on an island and they don't speak the language. Have you ever been to Malta? Not the little island off of Crete, nope. You could actually see this island in the maps section in the back of your Bible if you wanna geek out. It's really cool, it's still there, you could see it. And there's still people that live on Malta. That's not what I'm talking about. Have you ever been to a place that you never intended on going? You never wanted to be. You had a plan and a purpose and somehow you ended up speaking a language that you don't even understand. Have you been to Malta? See, Paul was supposed to go to Rome, but he ended up on Malta. Paul was supposed to have a meeting with Caesar, the most powerful man in the world during this time, and he ended up on Malta. He's on tiny, itty bitty little Malta. So I ask you again, have you been to Malta? Have you been to a place where you know and you're supposed to go, God showed you what you're gonna do and somehow you're ended up in this place and you're like, God, how did I get there? What is Malta? Malta is the divorce you didn't see coming. Malta is the breast cancer you never thought would happen. Malta is the loss of job that you were surprised by. Malta is that friend that betrayed you that you never thought would. Malta is the place where you're like, I know what God showed me I'm supposed to be doing and yet I'm here. Have you been to Malta? Now the Bible says that the prisoners were so kind. They were so kind to Paul. There was 276 uh, people in total and the, the islanders, the barbarians built a fire for them. And, and, and scripture tells us Paul is helping them out. That's why I love my Bible boyfriend. And sometimes when I talk to my husband, Matt, you know, you Nordic people, like he's of Drummond descent and the Drummonds are so good with the money and the order and the bullet points. But I'm like, I wonder what it looked like if you could be like, like Paul and help set up fires after surviving storms and stuff. <laughs> True. Thank God for therapy. So Paul was on a ship, wrongly accused. Let's go through the litany again. Paul was wrongly accused. He was put on a ship. He was supposed to go to Rome. There is a storm. The man survives a ship that's busted. Doggy paddles in salty water to a shore. The islanders, islanders help them and he begins to help them with a fire. Look at verse three. Paul gathered a pile of wood brush. Ooh, a man who loves to serve people. Single ladies, take note of that, okay? Notice the people at the doors and do a metal check. Do they have a ring on? You could smile to the glory of God. They might be your Boaz, all right? <laughs> Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, 
as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself to his hands. <laughs> Wait, nah, no, no, this is not happening. In Yiddish, there's this proverb that says, it could be worse. Because then you found hope that like, it could be worse. Well, let me tell you, in Paul's situation, shipwrecked, doggy paddled, building a fire, this is the worst, okay? He didn't get a mosquito bite or a bug bite. It's a flipping snake, snake knife. Wait, snake knife? Snake bite, snake, oh my gosh. Snake bite, there we go. <laughs> and the Bible says he fastened to his hand. The snake is, 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 is dangling off of his hand. And I don't want to interpret the text correctly, so I'm going to step away from my Bible for a second. But we're going to discover that the islanders, the Maldens, were making some assessments. We're going to read it in a second. But sometimes I feel in our life, if there's snakes that are hanging from our hands, it's real easy for Salty Sal and Bitter Betty and Judgmental John to look at these snakes and describe the reason why. Oh, well, if you just would have done that, if you should have done that, well, when you did that, uh, 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 Paul is about to shake this trash off. And if you came in here today, you came in here yesterday, and somebody has tried describing to you why you are going through what you're going, you say, bump you, bro, I served God. I may not know the why, but you don't either. I put my trust in God, okay? That's a little freezy and a funsy for you. Look at verse 3. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood as he put it on the fire, a viper driven up by the heat, fastened itself to him. And they're about to say, he did something wrong. That's why this is happening. He must be a murderer. That's what the Maltese are saying. And I love this, this next verse because Paul preaches one of the most powerful sermons of the New Testament and he didn't even say a word. Take note, look at verse five, but somebody say, but. No, no, you got to say it like from L.A., but, because I like big butts and I cannot lie. Them other brothers can't deny. When Paul breaks it down in this itty-bitty space, you're my, no, nah, just kidding, here we go. <laughs> but Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill. Ooh. Paul didn't say a word. He didn't try to convince the haters, the doubters, the skeptics. No, I'm a man of God. No, he just went boop, 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 bye. <laughs> Sayonara, uh-uh, nope, it's gone. He just shook it off. And you might be going through the storm. You might have survived a shipwreck. You might have doggy paddled to your shore. You might be on solid foundation, sure footing now. And people are gonna try to ascribe something to you. You just <laughs> shake it off. Why wasn't Paul concerned? Paul knew he wasn't gonna die on Malta. Paul wasn't gonna make a scene, because Paul got a word. I'm not gonna die on Malta because Rome is waiting for me. This is not my final destination. I'm not preaching this message for you, family. I'm preaching this message for me. This ain't my final destination. There will be no gravestone here on this Malta because Rome is waiting for me. And that's what I want you to understand. You might not know the who, you, excuse me, you might not know the why, but you must know the who. And this isn't just for you. This is for everyone who's watching you because you know people are watching you and they're looking, how will you respond? So Paul shakes off the snake, look at verse six. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a what? Said he was a what? <laughs> Did anyone help him? Did anyone run up and say, let me suck the venom out of your arm? No, they watch. Uh-oh, what's gonna happen? Uh-uh. Child of God, do you know that people are watching you? When those snake bites come, they're gonna be like, how are they going to respond? The Bible says that they were shocked and expected him to die. And guess what? People are looking at us the same way. See, there's a thief, an enemy who has come to steal, kill, and destroy to see what you're made of. You can have joy in the middle of a storm. You could have hope in the middle of a raging sea. You can have peace when snakes bite you. Why? Because you might not know the why, but we know the who. Now, 
he didn't swell up and die. And then all of a sudden they begin to change their mind and said he was a God. Now this is number, this is reason 97,627. Why you never trust when people try telling you what's wrong with your life. Cause they don't know. Remember they said the same thing to Jesus with palm branches, Hosanna, Hosanna, the one to come. And three days later, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Minds are fickle, people are fickle. No, 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 I need to be honest with you right now. I want us to have like a keep it real moment. By a show of hands, how many people are in Malta right now? Yeah, you're in Malta, the place that you never thought that you were gonna be. So the question I'm gonna ask everyone here is, what do we do in Malta? What do we do in Malta? Paul didn't want to go to Malta. Paul didn't plan to go to Malta. Paul didn't expect to go to Malta. And yes, he's there. And I think about all those people that we saw yesterday, the wives that are standing in faith for the healing of their husband, the the mothers that are standing in, in, in faith for their children, the people who need healing. Guess what? What do you do on that Malta? Paul makes Malta matter. He could have got bitten and got bitter but he's about to do some ministry wherever he's at. Look at verse seven. Uh, Nearby there was an estate that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us into his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. Ooh, so Paul is now all of a sudden, he goes from zero to hero. He is a local hero and he gets invited to some bougie house. The question I'm asking today is, what if your adversity, the thing that has been knocking you down, what if your adversity was actually the thing that opens the door to your opportunity? Opportunity. Ooh, because that's what we see here. What if your adversity is the thing that leads you to opportunity? And we could stand like Paul and say, no, I had to go to that storm. I had to doggy paddle to shore. I had to get bitten by the snake because there was something for me to do. So Paul is there for three days. And over three, these three days, something happens. He meets a man. He meets Publius's father. Look at verse eight. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. This is bad. Nobody during this time wanted dysentery. There's no Pedialyte back in that day. There's no Imodium AD, all right? You have dysentery, you done. So this daddy is on his deathbed. But something is about to change because there's a purpose in the pain. There's a plan that God is maneuvering. So while Paul is in Publius's house, guess what? He discovered that Publius needed a miracle. And there is about to be a miracle in Malta. Look at verse nine. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Sorry, verse eight, I lied. Thank you, slides, you're on it. Paul went in to see him and after prayer, placed his hands on top of him and healed him. So what happens because of this miracle on Malta? Look at verse nine. When this had happened, the rest of the sick of the island came and were cured. At what point did Paul realize that there's a ministry on Malta that needed to take place? At what point did Paul say, oh, oh snap, I went through this for a reason. God, you're gonna use this. What if that is our lens? What if that is our filter? What if that is our response to God? God, I'm going through this cancer for a reason. God, my wayward child, I'm gonna pray them back for a reason. What, what, What does God want us to do? So let me just pause and tell you something. He placed his hands, Paul placed his hands on Publius's dad's body. And then scripture tells in verse nine that he placed his hands on people who were sick. Do not miss a detail. I want us to jump into the spaces between the letters on this page. You're telling me that the hand that was bitten by the snake that was supposed to kill him was the same hand that brought healing? Child of God, I want you to know the thing that you thought was gonna take you out was gonna be the thing that will bring healing to so many people. What storm have you survived? What shipwreck have you survived? What fire have you survived? What, what, what snake bite have you survived? What judgment have you survived? Because it is in that that the Lord will begin to use and there will be miracles on Malta. I'm here to tell you that you are Malta for a reason. Look at verse nine again. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. After, after word got out, guess what? Everyone started coming. Everyone came to a house and guess what was birth? A church. Paul went through so much so that others could experience healing. Somebody say it had to happen. 
Now I want you to tell your soul, it had to happen. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, it had to happen. Because you could have got bitten and you could have got bitter, but it had to happen. In your hands, God has some healing to do. And I may not know why this is happening to you, but I do know the who. And I have come to tell you like Paul, we will survive. If we are not dead, then our God is not done. God is good. God knows good. God does good. Even on my Malta, even on my Malta, he is a miracle maker. He is a way maker. He is leading a way where there is no way. He is paving a path that we will begin to walk on. That is our God. And we can't quit in the storm. We can't quit on the shore. We can't quit when we're bit. We can't quit when everyone thinks we're a hero or a zero. We can't quit because there is work to do. In your hands, there is healing. In your hands, there is freedom. Not because you cute, not because you good, but Jesus said the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave is alive in me. I'm done with this. We're about to worship up in here. The same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave is alive in us. There is some miracles on Malta, sisters. Yes, there is. So what we're going to do right now is that we're going to give glory to a good God. I may not know the why, but I know the who. And I'm going to worship the who because he is good to me. I have been bit, I have been shipwrecked, I'm experienced loss, but my God is good. So child of God, can we stand to our feet? And in this moment, before we go to lunch, I want our soul to be full. I want our soul to be full. Can we begin to sing this song? I believe we're gonna sing some Waymaker up in here today. Spirit of God, will you make a way where there is no way? Will you open up doors that every man have shut? And will you close doors? that are not of you. We thank you, we love you, we praise you, and we ask that you do your miracles on Malta. In Jesus' name.